Amen. Open your copy of the Word of God this morning to 2 Timothy. I'm going to begin reading at chapter 2 and verse 8 in just a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We are going to carry on in our series that we have called Last Words to Live By. Paul's second letter to the young pastor Timothy, his last recorded words in all of the New Testament in the 13 books that he was responsible for. Today as we come to our place in chapter 2, I have come to encourage you to remind yourself of the truth. And that is based on a direct command that Paul gave to the young pastor Timothy here. He says in verse 14 of chapter 2, Remind them, those that you're pastoring and leading, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit. Boy, we can all get there sometimes, can't we? Arguing about things that don't amount to a hill of beans. Warn them not to strive about words to no, to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. That means in essence that we need to be careful what we hear, what we say, and who we talk to. Why is that? Why this command from Paul to Timothy? Well, it's because we live in a world of lies and liars. We live in a world of foolish arguments and divisive arguers. We can spend our time believing lies and squabbling about things that really don't amount to a hill of beans, or we can think and live and speak and walk in the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I've come to do today is to encourage you to remind yourself the truth, and in particular this morning, really to come back and to remember and to rejoice over some of these foundational truths about our faith in Christ and the grace of God and found in the truth of the Word of God. So let me read for us this morning. 2 Timothy, beginning chapter 2 and verse 8. If you're there, say amen. amen. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the Word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now this is a faithful saying. For if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. So much good in those verses today. Some foundational truths for us that I want us to rejoice in and reflect on for a little while this morning. First and foremost, notice with me in verse 8, that Jesus Christ is not dead. Christ is not dead. Look what he said in verse 8. He said, Jesus Christ. You know who we're talking about, Jesus Christ. Jesus, that's an English transliteration of the Hebrew name Yeshua. Yeshua, the name of Jesus, our Savior, it literally means Yahweh is salvation. So every time you take the name of Jesus onto your lips, you are declaring the salvation that is found in the Most High God. Jesus Christ. Christ, Christ, not his last name, but his title. Christos means anointed. The Hebrews used to say Mashiach, that he's the Messiah. He is the anointed Son of God, the only Savior for mankind. And notice there that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the seed of David. He is the descendant of David. Now, why is that important? It's because... There's only one Jesus, there's only one man who fulfilled all the prophecy. Remember the prophecy began right there in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, it continued down through the days of Noah, finally down to the days of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joshua and Caleb and Elijah and great men of God, all the way down to the man of God, King David, whom the Bible says was a man after the heart of God. It was on David's mind and heart to build a house of worship for the Lord. 
David was not given that opportunity because the Bible says he was a man of war, but that responsibility did pass to his son. Even though David was not permitted to build a house of worship, a temple for the Lord, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God made a promise to David. He said, I am going to establish the throne of your descendants. I'm going to establish the throne of the seed that comes after you and his throne and his kingdom will be everlasting. Jesus Christ is the son of David. He's the seed of David. And the Davidic covenant says that the throne of our Lord Jesus Christ shall be established forever and forever. Listen, there's a reason why we take up the name of Jesus. There's a reason why we trust in Jesus because according to the word of God, he's the only one who fulfilled all the prophecy and he is the only hope, the only answer, the only savior for all of mankind. Jesus Christ, the seed of David, the Bible says here. Look what it says in verse eight. Was raised from the dead according to my gospel. According to my gospel. What is gospel? Gospel in the New Testament is the Greek word euangelio. It means good news. The gospel is good news and the good news is this, that God kept his promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Solomon and all the prophets all the way until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, was born to Mary and Joseph and that little tower of the flock in Bethlehem, such meager and mild and humble beginnings. Jesus Christ learned the trade of a carpenter from his father, Joseph. The Bible leads us to believe he was about 30 years old when Jesus Christ began his public ministry. The Bible says he went about healing the people of all kinds of diseases, teaching them the, the law of God, preaching the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. You would think a man such as Jesus would be beloved for all of the miracles, the people that he fed, the eyes that he opened, the miracles that he did. But Jesus was maligned and hated by those who should have been welcoming his coming. And you know the rest of the story. How on a Thursday, Thursday night they took Jesus, they apprehended him when he was praying with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says they took him, they brought him to the house of Caiaphas where he stood trial before the Sanhedrin. The Bible calls them the council. In an illegal trial during the wee hours of the night, Thursday night into Friday morning, Jesus Christ stood trial. He was found guilty of blasphemy, but that was not enough according to Roman law for him to be crucified. They had to have the death warrant signed by the Roman authority. So they took him to Pilate. Pilate didn't want to have anything to do with him, so they sent him to Herod. Herod said, what is he to me? Send him back to Pilate. And standing before Pilate, Pilate thoroughly examined Jesus. He didn't think there was any reason for death in him. But in order to appease the crowds, the Bible says Pilate washed his hands and condemned Jesus to die by crucifixion. You know how Jesus was beaten beyond recognition. You know how Christ was forced to carry his cross beam outside the city walls of Jerusalem to a place that you can still go to and stand at today called Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. And there along the side of the road, Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross hanging between two thieves. Let me remind you, the agony, the crucifixion, the death that Jesus Christ suffered began with his beating. But then he was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. Jesus Christ hung on the cross alive for six hours. Can you imagine? Not able to stand, being suspended on a cross with spikes in your wrist and your feet. And for six hours, that's what happened to Christ. Until finally at about 3 p.m., the Bible says that Jesus Christ cried out, To Talestai, which is to say it is finished. Talking about the price of our atonement being paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. And then Bible, the Bible says his last recorded words before his passing on the cross was simply this. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
And with that, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Not everybody believes that Jesus died. Some people believe that Jesus simply swooned death. That he didn't really die on the cross. But we know according to the gospel that Jesus did in fact die. In fact, Paul says that he's talking about the gospel here in verse 8. The gospel is simply this. That Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He actually did die. And when Jesus died on that cross at 3 p.m., he was taken down from the cross before the sunset. Do you know why? Because it was almost the Sabbath day. And the Jewish people, it was unlawful for them to leave somebody on the cross crucified on the Sabbath day. So they took him down. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and said, can I have the body of, Bo- of, of, of Jesus? And he said, yes, you may. And so they took the body of Jesus with Nicodemus. They went and they... They went to a garden tomb that was right next to Golgotha. And they took Jesus and they buried him in a brand new tomb that you can still go and see in Jerusalem today. And they rolled the stone in its place. Christ was dead and he was buried on Friday, on Saturday. But then early on Sunday morning, when the women came to the tomb... They came to anoint the body of Jesus with their spices and aloes as was their custom. But when they got there, they had wondered to themselves along the way, how are we going to move the stone out of its place? But when they got there, the stone was already gone. And the temple guard that had been placed there to guard the tomb of Jesus, they were not there. And when they went inside, the body of Jesus was not there. But what they did find on the inside was an angel standing at the head and an angel standing at the foot of where Jesus Christ would have laid a perfect picture of the Ark of the Covenant in the old temple, a reminder to them that this Jesus truly is the Christ. He's completely and fully God. And not only is He no longer dead, He is absolutely alive. He has won His victory over the grave. And the Bible says that for 40 days after that, not just to the women, not just to the disciples, but Jesus Christ presented himself alive to hundreds of eyewitnesses. 40 days Jesus Christ is alive until finally he took his disciples to the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, he had some very last words for his disciples on this earth. He said, men, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be witnesses of me beginning in Jerusalem and then out to Judea and then out to Samaria and then out to the uttermost parts of the world. You're going to bear witness of this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that while Jesus was still talking, he began to ascend up into the heavens where Jesus, the Bible says, sat down at the right hand of God. And I'm telling you, just as sure as I'm standing here today, Jesus Christ is alive. And all power is held in His hands. Don't you be convinced by those who say that, you know, Jesus didn't really die. He just swooned death. You know, some people believe that the disciples came and they stole the body of Jesus. You can believe that if you like. I choose to believe according to the word of God that Jesus Christ was dead, that he was buried, and that he rose victorious over sin and death on the third day, that the grave could not hold him and keep him down. Jesus Christ is alive. And so when we think about all the other religions in the world, I mean this with all respect. But the founders of those other religions, did you know that there's something that's key to all of them? Their ashes, their remains, their body, bones, whatever is left of those men, those leaders, whether it be Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad, all of them have a place where you can go and you can worship and commemorate their life with their remains. If you'd like to, Well, actually, you can't this February. It's already full. But some of you are going to go with me this February. And you're going to see the tomb of Jesus Christ. And when you get there, you know what's true? His body is not there. Why don't I preach Islam? Because Muhammad is dead. 
Why don't I preach Buddhism because Buddha died and didn't rise again? Why do I preach Confucianism? Why don't I preach Confucianism? Because Confucius died and you can visit his remains to this day. But Jesus Christ is not dead. Jesus Christ is alive. And the Bible is emphatically clear. There is one name given among men whereby men must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus Christ alone. That is why we are a Christian church. That is why we preach the gospel. That is why we believe that Jesus Christ is alive. He's our hope in life, in death, in the mountains, in the valleys. We trust in the Lord Jesus. Jesus is alive. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, No matter how ominous it may seem, you keep this in mind. Jesus Christ was placed in that tomb on a Friday and walked victorious out on Sunday. No matter what you are going through, Jesus Christ can deliver you because he's alive. Number two, let me say to you, now not only is Christ not dead, but scripture is not bound. I love this. Have you ever seen this in verse nine? Paul said, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. If you want to serve Christ, if you want to preach the gospel, if you want to live for God, you're going to suffer trouble. And Paul tells us here specifically what kind of trouble he's in. He says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Who thought Paul was an evildoer? Well, the Jews thought Paul was an evildoer. Because he preached Jesus and he preached the resurrection of the dead. He preached that Jesus was completely and fully God. And that was heresy. That was blasphemy to the Jewish people. And so they accused Paul of being an evildoer. But even the Romans had gotten in on the act. Where at the beginning Pilate simply wanted to wash his hands of Jesus. As the decades rolled forward we found that the Romans actually started putting the Christians in the Colosseum, feeding them to the lions, burning down Jerusalem. The Romans thought Paul was an evildoer. They thought he was guilty of sedition because he said there was a king other than Caesar. And by the way, Paul was right. There's a king much greater than Caesar. There's a king much greater than our president. There's a king much greater than any prime minister or king or queen on the face of this planet and that's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And his name is Jesus Christ. And for his faith in Jesus and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus, he was condemned as an evildoer by many people. And look at this. He said, I'm suffering so badly. I suffer trouble as an evildoer even to the point of chains. How'd your last week go? Did it go okay? How many trials and troubles did you have? Have a hard time? Were you depressed? Were you discouraged? Did bills pile up that you had no way of anticipating? What happened to you this past week? Some of you dealt with very serious things. Some of you might have dealt with your own health issues. Some of you might have dealt with health issues of a dear loved one. Some of you may have even dealt with the death of a loved one or a family member. We go through a lot in this life. And yes, we do go through a lot in our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm pretty confident that I can say today that none of us in our service to God this past week found ourselves in prison. None of us found ourselves locked up for Christ this past week. Have you ever wondered if maybe you'd you'd be given a citation for Jesus? You know, we've been out doing Project 37912, and I think I told you last week there was a place that said, we don't want y'all coming back here. We pay money for y'all not to be in here. I said, okay, God bless you. You know what we did this past Wednesday? We went back. (laughs) And we shared Jesus with every household in that community. You know why? Because I don't serve that guy. I serve Jesus Christ. And so do you. And one of these days, guess what? We may get cited. We may get locked up. We may be placed on trial. They may take away our rights. They may take away our property. It may all happen, but we've got to decide at the end of the day, does the Lord Jesus Christ mean more to me than these chains they could put on me? Listen to me when I tell you this. You can bind a child of God but you cannot bind the Word of God. 
Look what Paul says there in the passage. He says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. Skeptics have tried to attack the Word of God. Atheists have tried to silence the Word of God. Dictators have tried to stop the Word of God. But it's interesting how many of them have passed away and the Word of God and the truth of God continues to march on. You can try to stop the Word of God, but you cannot. God says to us, He says, you know what? I've sent my word out to the world and my word will not return to me void. But will accomplish that thing, that purpose for which I sent it out. Don't be ashamed to identify yourself with God. Don't be ashamed to stand on the truth of Scripture. They can bind you. They can harass you. They can imprison you. But they can never lock up the word of God that you have staked your life down on. Keep trusting in the Word. Keep preaching the Word. Keep standing on the truth of Scripture. You know what you and I do, though, sometimes? We know this Word. We know this Bible. We know it's true. Sometimes we feel like we need to defend the Word of God, and I have no problem defending the Scripture. I have no problem defending truth. I'm sure you feel the same way. But you know what the Bible really needs? It doesn't need your defense really so much. What it really needs for you and I to do is to unleash it. I want you to think about the Word of God in your life being kind of like a a big, strong lion. If I own a lion, I probably don't have to defend that lion. I'll open the cage and let him defend himself, right? Why don't we open up the truth to those around us and see what God begins to do? You say, well, they'll think I'm a fool if I tell them the truth. Well, let them think that. But you you plant the truth of the Word of God inside them and begin to watch the Holy Spirit begin to move in the midst of that. As we've been putting these Jesus bags out in the community, my expectation is not that every person is going to be saved. In fact, unfortunately, according to what Jesus said, the majority of them will not be saved. But you know what will happen? As you tell the truth and you plant a seed of truth in somebody's life, the Holy Spirit begins to move. And then people have to make a decision. Am I going to believe this truth? Or am I going to refuse to accept it? I learned a long time ago, God does not hold me responsible for somebody else's decision for Christ. That's between them and the Lord. But what God does hold me responsible for is them having an opportunity to receive truth and to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I need to unleash the Word of God that we have because the Word of God's not bound. Listen to me. You know what I love? I can share the gospel with people. You can share the gospel with people. They can run you off. They can be upset at you. They can call you every name in the book. But when you're not there, guess who still is? The Holy Spirit's still right there. Convicting people. Talking to their heart. Convincing them of the truth. Take comfort in the fact today that the Word of God is not bound. Number three, let me say to you now that the mission is not over. Our mission as followers of Jesus is not over. Look at verse 10. Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Now what's he talking about? I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Who are the elect? Bible, St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 29, Those whom God foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. The elect are those whom God in His foreknowledge had a full understanding would come to faith in Christ. And that knowledge is reserved for God alone. And so Paul says, for the sake of those who have not yet even heard the gospel, known only to God to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, for their sake I endure all things that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So let me say it again. Paul willfully suffered persecution for the sake of those who had not yet come to Christ. Why would you want to make disciples? Why would you want to share the gospel with somebody? Well, first and foremost... You want to do it because you want to bring glory and honor to God. 
Paul said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. It should be the highest aspiration of your life to bring glory and honor and praise to the Lord. So you share the gospel with others because you want God to receive the glory. But number two, because you love God and you're eternally grateful for what God has done for you. All this truth that we were singing about earlier, we ought to celebrate those things. We've been cleansed by God. We've been sealed by God. We've been justified by God. Our name has been recorded in the Lamb's book of life. And so out of gratitude for all that God has done for me, I ought to want to share Jesus with others so that they can experience the same saving power. But what else should motivate us? Why should you want to go through trials? Why should you want to be maligned and marginalized for identifying with Christ? Why would you willfully be made fun of for identifying yourself with the truth of Scripture and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Why in the world would a person do that? It'd be much easier just to go along with the rest of the world, right? Isn't that where most people are right now? As our culture, as our world is slouching down to Sodom and Gomorrah, it just seems like most of us are on the drift. Don't rock the boat. Don't identify with Jesus. Don't share the gospel. Why in the world would we come against the tide, the flood of wickedness in our world by standing for Christ and pointing others to Jesus? Paul says in this case, one of the motivating factors for him has been that others might come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you a Christian today? Let me ask you that simply. Are you a Christian today? If the answer for you is yes, here's what's true to you this morning. Somebody took their time. Somebody inconvenienced themselves. Somebody might have even subjected themselves to mockery and being marginalized by others just so that they could share the gospel with you. Aren't you glad somebody inconvenienced themselves? Aren't you glad that somebody was willing to identify themselves with Jesus so that you could receive Christ as the Lord of your life? What if that person hadn't been there? What if that person hadn't taken the time and made the sacrifice to make sure that you know about Jesus? Where would you be today? Where would I be? Paul says, I'm going to keep on suffering. I'm going to keep getting locked up. I'm going to keep getting beaten. I'm going to keep getting shipwrecked. I'm going to keep having everything under heaven happen to me just so that through me, others may come to a saving knowledge of Christ. What if, what if, church, seeing others one to faith in Jesus was as important to us as it was to Paul and Timothy and the rest? You say all those things that happen in the Bible times, they can't happen anymore. Are you sure about that? Does the Holy Spirit not move anymore? Has God lost his power somewhere along the way? You know why there was such a great move of God in the midst of the early church? Because they truly believed that Jesus was alive. In preparation for this message, I looked at a study. You know what it said? This is, this is a poll conducted in 2021. said, of Americans, regular Americans, 66% believe what the scripture says about the resurrection of Jesus. Now get that. 66% of Americans say they believe that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead according to the truth claims of Scripture. A lady was responding to the results of that survey and she said, it's wonderful and it's heartbreaking at the same time. Wonderful that so many people would say, so many Americans, even in this postmodern age, that two-thirds of Americans would say, I genuinely believe, I truly believe, according to the Scripture, that Jesus Christ is alive. But what's so heartbreaking about that? That faith, that knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus seems to have such little impact on their life. 
What if believing the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ compelled us to start going to other people to make sure that they also had an opportunity to come to faith in Christ like we have? Listen to me, friend. Until Jesus Christ comes back, the mission is not over. If there's even one person left in this world that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we will move heaven and earth and do everything we can to make certain that that person has an opportunity to come to faith in Christ. And let me tell you, it's not just one or two or 200 or 2,000. It's two billion and more who still don't know that Jesus Christ is Lord. The mission's not over. It's not over. Number four, the future is not confusing. The future is not confusing. But look at verses 11 and 12. You say, preacher, I think the future is confusing. I've read Daniel chapter 9, that's confusing. I've read Revelation 12, that's confusing. I've read, I've, I've read Revelation 19 and 20, that seems confusing to me. Some details of things yet to come can be confusing to us because there are things that have not yet been revealed, things that have not yet been opened, and so there are some things, some details about the end of time that there is difference of opinion about. Things that can be kind of confusing even among Bible scholars. But let me help you understand what I'm saying here. The most foundational, fundamental elements of the future are not confusing at all. And look how Paul explains them here. Number one, he says, if we died with him, with Christ, we shall also live with him. You say, well, none of us died with Jesus. None of us were there at Calvary 2,000 years ago. How could any of us have died with Jesus? The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, if you've placed your faith in Christ, if you've been baptized into Jesus, then you have died with Christ. And what that means is, spiritually, you've been born again and you have died to sin. And Paul says, if we have died to sin, how shall we let it reign in us any longer? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Galatia, he said, I have been crucified with Christ and I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Listen to me, sir or ma'am. When you placed your faith in Jesus, at that moment you crucified your flesh and said, I am going to allow the Holy Spirit of God to determine my coming, my going, my conversation, my actions, my thoughts, my giving, everything about me determined by the Holy Spirit of God that now dwells inside of me. Now, is that to say that you and I are totally free from the flesh? Absolutely not. What did Jesus say to the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. After we got saved doesn't mean that you're no longer human. We still war with the flesh every day. But the Bible says through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can mortify the flesh. We can crucify the flesh so that we can live for the glory of the Lord. And the Bible says that if you've been joined to Christ, you've died with Him and His crucifixion. And if you've died to Him, you shall also live and reign with Him in glory. But the reverse of that's true as well. If you've not died to yourself through faith in Christ, you may live and do whatever you want down here on this world, but when you come into the hereafter, the Bible says in the Revelation, you'll have to suffer the second death, which is the worst of all. If we died with Christ, we'll live with Him. But look what else Paul says there in verse 12. He says, if we endure now, we will reign later. What might a Christian have to endure? Well, we've already talked about some of it. Lies, betrayal, mockery, persecution, trials, hardships. All these are things that we must endure for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ until Jesus calls us home. But what the Bible says here, that if we will willfully day by day, moment by moment, second by second, endure those trials and troubles and problems, 
The Bible says when we come into the hereafter, we'll not have to endure any of that anymore. Won't it be good in the hereafter not to ever have to endure a trial again? Never to have to battle with sin again? Never to have to be disappointed again? Never had to have a problem or adversity ever again. The Bible says if we'll endure it down here, we'll reign over all of that. When we get up there, you know what Jesus said to his disciples? He said, guys, I'm telling you the truth. When you come into the hereafter, those of you that have suffered with me, those of you that have left everything to follow me, those of you that have laid your life on the line for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come into the hereafter, I am telling you, I will place each one of you over the 12 tribes of Israel. We will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ if we suffer for him down here. You know what the Revelation says is the mark of a true believer? That they over come. Let me ask you, friend, are you an overcomer through the Lord Jesus Christ? You want to know if you're saved? I ask you today, are you overcoming for Christ? And if you overcome, you will reign with Him. And look what else verse 12 says. This is true. Listen, everybody. If we deny Him here, He'll deny us there. As it pertains to Jesus and the gospel, I know we're living in a day and a time where it's not popular by any means to say that I am a Bible-believing Christian. Man, it's being a Bible-believing Christian in this culture has fallen on hard times, hasn't it? To publicly identify yourself with Christ and with the truth. Now you can identify yourself with Jesus and people are probably okay with that. But listen to me when I tell you this. You are not truly identifying yourself with the living word Christ unless you are identifying yourself with the written word scripture. Because the Bible says to know Christ is to know the truth. And the Bible says that His Word is truth. So if I'm going to truly identify with Christ, I've got to identify with the truth of the Word of God because it points to Christ. So we've got a choice down here. When you're on your job, you can identify publicly with Jesus. When you're in your school, you can choose to identify with Jesus in the Bible. When you go to the marketplace... Or you can think to yourself, others might cast me out if I identify with Jesus. Others might think differently about me if I publicly identify myself with Christ and the Word of God. Other people might make fun of me. It might cost me something. It might even cost me my job or my livelihood to publicly identify with Christ. Let's be honest this morning. We've all been guilty of this somewhere along the way. We have put a bowl over our light because at times we were too ashamed to publicly identify with Jesus. Be very careful about that. Because Jesus said, if you deny me down here, I'll deny you up there. Now where is up there? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. At the end of time, every single one of us is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and Jesus, the judge, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is either going to publicly identify himself with us or he's going to say to us, away with you, you worker of iniquity, because I never knew you. Do you know Jesus? Have you placed your faith in Christ? A good indicator is this. If you're not willing to publicly identify yourself with Christ in the Word of God, make certain that you've genuinely placed your faith in Jesus. If we deny Him down here, church, He'll deny us up there. But the reverse of that is true as well. We find Jesus saying in the Gospels, if you will confess me before men, then I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Think about how empty and how hollow and how hopeless it would feel for Jesus to say to you at the judgment seat, I don't know you. 
Get away from me. But the greatest words that could ever utter across your mind, your ears, and flow and filter into your soul would be to hear the Lord Jesus Christ say, you come in and you receive your eternal reward. I know you. I saved you. I adopted you. I bought you with my own blood. Now you enter in to your eternal reward. Everybody, listen to me, friend. Everybody down here can forsake you. But if Jesus stands with you and you stand with him, you've got everything you need. Identify with Jesus Christ. The future is not confusing. Number five, and finally, let me say to you now, salvation is not revocable. There's difference of opinion about this, and I want to be sensitive in the way that I deal with this because I know that people have different ideas about this, but listen to what the Bible says here in verse 13. Salvation is not revocable. That means you can't lose your salvation because look what verse 13 says. If we are faithless, I think the King James says, if we believe not. Remember there was a man who came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I've got a son and my son is possessed with a demon spirit. And when the demon spirit overtakes my son, guess what happens? It torments him. It throws him down. It throws him into the fire. He has suffered as a result of demon possession. And he said, Lord, I brought my son to your disciples and I asked him, can you please cast the demon out of my son? And the man said, your disciples weren't able to do it. And Jesus looked at the man and he said this. He said, if you believe... All things are possible to him that believes. And the man said these iconic words. He said, Lord, I believe. But would you please help my unbelief? Can we be honest? Sometimes we all seem to be a little faithless. Sometimes we all seem to conduct ourselves in a manner that seems to indicate that perhaps we don't really know God because we don't really seem to be living for Him. We don't really seem to be wanting to be submitted and surrendered to Him. We're spending too much time submitting to ourselves and our own desires and our own agendas that we don't really seem to have time to submit ourselves to Christ and what the Lord might want for us. Wouldn't it be great if we could all say that we're all 100% faithful to God all the time? But you know, even Paul said in his letter to the Roman believers, he said, the things that I want to do for Christ are the things that I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those sinful, wicked things, Paul even admitted at the end of Romans chapter 7, those are the things I find myself doing. Man, don't we all identify with that? Paul said, oh, wretched man I am, who's going to deliver me from this body of sin? Because Paul goes right in the very next words into Romans chapter 8. He says, yet there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Listen to me when I tell you this. You did not earn your salvation through good works. No matter how good you think you are, you didn't pray enough, you didn't study the Bible enough, you didn't go to church enough, you didn't witness enough, you didn't do anything that was even close to being enough to earn your salvation. So let me say it one more time, including this preacher right here. There's not a one of us in this room today that has earned our salvation through good works. The reason that you are saved today is because you have trusted in Christ and you have received the finished work of the cross on your behalf by receiving the grace of God through faith in Jesus. So listen to me. You did not earn your salvation by good works. You know what that tells me? It tells me you can't lose your salvation through bad works. Let me say it like this. 
God didn't give you salvation because of what you did for Him. God gave you salvation because of what He's done for you in Christ. And the reason now then that you are eternally secure as a follower of Jesus is not because of what you've done for God. The reason you are eternally secure is because of what God has done for you through Christ Jesus, His Son. That ought to make an old sleepy Baptist shout. (laughs) That even in the moments when I'm faithless, even in the moments when I fall short, even in the moments when I fall into sin, that I am held safe in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ is held safe in the hand of Almighty God because Jesus said in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And if the devil and every demon of hell wants to come and try and take you out of the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, I say, let them come and try. They will not be successful. Because if you have been adopted into God's family, listen to me. You know how this verse makes sense? I first read this verse about 30 years ago as a young person. About the age of some of these kids sitting down here. And I said, God, I don't understand. Will you show me? How can a person who's faithless have any hope of salvation? You know what God showed me? Look what it says in verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Now look, here's the key word right here. Because he cannot deny himself. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you were forgiven. The Bible says you were adopted. The Bible says you were justified. The Bible says you were sanctified. But you know, the Bible also says this in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. In other words, listen to me. I want to get a Baptist to shout here pretty soon. When you got saved... You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. That is to say that the Holy Spirit inhabited you. So that now when the Father in heaven looks down on you, He doesn't just see you wrapped in all of your sin. He sees you and He looks at you covered by the righteousness of Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And even when you walk down dead end paths of sin, God says, that's not just Him down there. That's not just her down there. That's Him or her inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is a guarantee of future glory. A guarantee. Remember when a promise used to mean something down here? Remember when a guarantee used to mean something? (laughs) I was having a little project done at my house recently. Contracted the people that did the project were amazing. There was one aspect of the project that somebody else had to do. I bet you they told me five or six different times they were coming and didn't come. See, because when somebody tells you something down here now, I'll do it if I feel like doing it. See, a promise, a guarantee used to mean something. Doesn't mean quite as much down here as it used to, but let me tell you something. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God cannot lie. And if the Bible says that God has guaranteed you salvation through the inhabitation of the Holy Spirit in your life, what that means to me is you are eternally secure. Now, I'm also very careful about preaching the eternal security of the believer. Do you know why? Because sometimes we Baptists who champion the eternal security of the believer act as though now I have a license to sin. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, so now I can live and do whatever I want. Well, sir, ma'am, if you think that your life is about living and doing whatever you want, you were never saved to begin with. I'm not about giving people assurance that they're born again if they're not. If you haven't decided that God's the most important person in your life, you need to come to Christ today and surrender your life to Christ. But I do know this, the faith that falters was flawed from the first 
But if you've genuinely placed your faith in Jesus, if you've genuinely been sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're going to fall short. You're still going to mess up along the way. But when God looks at you, he says, that's my child, regenerated, sealed by my spirit, eternally secure. I don't know about you, but I just thank God today that my eternal security is not vested in my faithfulness. My eternal security is vested in the faithfulness of God. That's why we give him all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. Friend, why do you need to remind yourself of these truths that I've given you today? Because the devil will try to depress you. The, treble, the devil will try to divert you. The devil will try to deceive you. You know, the Bible says in John chapter 8 that the devil is the father of lies. That he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. If you don't believe the truth, if you start believing a lie, the devil gets a foothold in your life. And when he gets a foothold in your life, he takes a yard and then he takes a mile until finally he's consumed you completely. The only way that you and I can be victorious over our adversary, the devil, is to wield and to take into our hands the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we can send the devil and every demon of hell to flight when we live, when we walk, when we believe the truth of the Most High God. Remind yourself of the truth every moment, every day.